Welcome to our seminar on powerhouse shade plants. I'm James Baggett with Garden Gate Magazine, and I have a confession to make. I'm a shade gardener. In fact, I think it's more fun to garden in shade than in sun. So I was excited about this topic today uh, to delve into all of the great plants. You know, it's just a different palette of plants to pick from if you're picking from your sun plants or your shade plants. So it's gonna be a fun deep dive today into uh, as many of those plants as we can talk about. We've got a lot of plants to get through, so let's start with perennials. And of course, we're gonna start with the most popular perennial in the United States. It's also known as the friendship plant for good reason. There are so many hostas out there. Uh, you know, it's the backbone of the shade garden, uh, and it's super easy, and they are way collectible because they come in so many different colors and shapes and sizes. In fact, if you're into hostas, you should get yourself the hosta Pedia by Mark Zillis, and in fact, this is filled, as you can see, with some of the hostas available on the market today. Um, but uh, it, the foliage can vary from pale yellow to the deepest of blue greens. There's variegated forms available. Leaf shapes can be anything from long and sword-like to huge and heart-shaped. Many have corrugated textures as well. Uh, there's little four-inch dwarfs and miniature ones to some that spread to six feet wide. Uh, the largest hosta in the world is one known as Empress Wu, uh, about four feet tall in the right conditions, maybe even taller. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so be aware of that. They look great in containers as well, so don't forget, even though we think of them as an in-ground uh, perennial for the shade garden, try some of these newer, smaller, compact ones in some of your containers. Uh, they develop lovely spikes of often fragrant pink, lavender, or white flowers uh, during the summer. summer. Hummingbirds love those flowers. Uh, many of the later blooming ones are the ones in the Plantagenia family. Uh, have especially large white blossoms that are very high, highly fragrant and work very well uh, in cut flower arrangements. In fact, uh, the Japanese use the leaves very commonly in their cut flower arrangements. Um, Hardies from zones three to nine. Um, I wanted to make a note to, to tell you real quickly about uh, a process that you should look up called Rossing, R-O-S-S-I-N-G. If you spend some money and buy a great hosta, uh, that you like and you want it to replicate or multiply faster in the garden, there's an easy way at the time of planting of when you turn it upside down, you'll see that waxy basal plate on the hosta. And if you just uh, make a cross hatch on that, uh, it, no more than a quarter of an inch deep at the time of planting, that plant will divide into four plants uh, in that next growing season. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, you see here on the lower right, one of my very favorite hostas, Autumn Frost. Uh, I can't say enough about what it does to light up uh, the shade garden. Uh, well worth a spot in your garden if you don't have it yet. Um, and you see little blue mouse ears. You can't tell from the image here, but that's uh, probably about an eight inch clump of uh, hostas right there. And uh, my friend Karen Jimerson likes to say uh, the miniature hostas are as cute as a litter of Jack, uh, Jack Russell puppies. Columbines. Uh, also known as Granny's Bonnet. You see in the upper uh, right here are native uh, Aquilegia canadensis. Uh, these are known for their bell-shaped uh, spurred flowers. They range in colors from bright reds, yellows, orange, purples, bicolors, even blues as you can see here. Uh, there are more than 70 species of columbines. They're pretty short-lived perennials. Um, leaves are light green. Uh, uh, and they germinate in one season, bloom the next year. I rarely see, see the same individual plant uh, for more than one year. Uh, it is a thrill to see the first hummingbirds finding the brightly colored blossoms, so be sure to plant them where you can uh, catch a glimpse of the hummingbirds coming to feed. Um, in fact, our native columbine has a relationship with hummingbirds, and as they begin to bloom, uh, that it coincides with the northern migration of our ruby-throated hummingbirds. Columbine does best, of course, in part shade in moist, well-drained soils. Uh, sometimes you'll see uh, tracks on those leaves. That's from leaf miner damage. It uh, really doesn't cause that much damage to the plant. It really is just a cosmetic difference. Uh, and these are cold hardy from zones three to eight. Brunera, or uh, false forget-me-not, 
Uh, this is a popular shade plant because of the long-lasting clouds, as you can see here, of those bright blue, forget-me-not looking flowers that give it its common name. Uh, plants have those very striking that you can see here, uh, heart-shaped leaves that are green and also come in variegated hues of gray, silver, or white. Uh, you can see uh, the popular cultivar here, Jack Frost. Uh, it was actually in 2012 the perennial plant of the year. It blooms in early spring. They multiply politely and they form a lush understory. Use it as an accent in a shaded border or as a drift in a woodland. Uh, as added bonus, the leaves are so hairy uh, that deer and rabbits do not eat them. So a great plant if that's an issue for you. Uh, one to two feet tall, uh, part shade, tolerates um, a variety of soil conditions and cold hardy in USDA zones 327. Uh, definitely deserves a spot in the shade garden, especially if you uh, grow hostas. Uh, this is a curious plant. Uh, common name is Mary Bells. It's a uh, Latin name is Uvularia. Uh, charming wildflowers native uh, to the United States, grown for the, the handsome foliage. It's a little bit hard to detect here in these images, but also those bell-shaped yellow blooms. They have twisted petals and they dangle downward. Uh, easy to grow in shady, uh, moist places. It has, uh, the leaves are light green and each one is pierced through the stem. So it's hard to detect here, but it actually looks as though uh, uh, the leaves are sort of sewn uh, and stitched onto those stems when you look at the plant. Uh, it makes it very curious to look at. Uh, it uh, makes a great clump uh, in the garden, in the shade, and uh, that foliage persists after the flowers have left. Uh, it's named for the uvula, that fleshy thing that hangs at the back of your neck because of the similarity in the way the flowers hang. Uh, 18 to 24 inches tall, uh, cold hardy in USDA zones 4 to 9, so a great, delicate, uh, curious choice for the sun garden, for the shade garden. Uh, toad lilies, here is another very curious flower. Uh, Tricertus blooms in late summer, so this is really something unlike a lot of these uh, spring blooming flowers. Uh, but it, it, in late summer, we get surprised by these small orchid like flowers. Uh, they're speckled uh, white with shades of pur purple, uh, and they sparkle above these uh, stems of glossy green foliage. Uh, when most, uh, most other perennials have finished blooming uh, and the trees are going dormant uh, and getting ready to drop their leaves, that's when this just gets started. Uh, its name comes from the mottled uh, coloration of the flowers, which might remind some people of a toad, uh, but and like toads, these plants prefer shady, moist uh, places in the garden. Uh, in recent years, they've become easier to find in garden centers, uh, so check them out. There's some uh, very interesting co color combination. Uh, most begin blooming in, uh, between September and October, two to three feet tall, uh, in white lavender, sometimes even yellow flowers. Uh, splotched with those purple dots. Uh, no serious pests to speak of and hardy in cold zones uh, five to nine. Uh, you see uh, up in the, if you can detect with the ferns up in the upper left hand corner, uh, lightning striking. You can see how that adds that pop uh, of brightness in the shade garden. Virginia bluebells. Well, we can't get much more beloved than that. It's probably the number one ephemeral uh, across the United States. It's one of the most beautiful harbingers of spring. Uh, when I say ephemeral, I mean that, uh, that that produces its foliage and its blossom, and then in the heat of the summer, it goes dormant and disappears from the landscape. Uh, these are in the borage family. You can tell it by the blossoms that uh, resemble lung, lungwort or pulmonaria as well as comfrey. Uh, bluebells enjoy well-drained soils. Uh, where they can form large colonies, as you can see here. The flowers start off pink and gradually turn to their famous shade of light blue as they mature. Uh, bees, especially female bumblebees, love the blossoms. Uh, only the largest bees are able to sort of plow their way in to get to that nectar. Uh, uh, they are deer resistant, a major plus for suburban gardeners where that's a problem. Uh, and the plants, when they're happy, freely multiply. So you'll us usually see them uh, in large swaths. Uh, fairly easy to get established. Uh, one to two feet tall, 
lavender blue flowers, as I mentioned, uh, not bothered by any serious pests. I enjoy them as a cut flower uh, regularly. Cold hardy in USDA zones, three to seven. Virginia bluebells, Mertensia virginica. Foam flower, and you can see with one glance how this uh, flower, Tiarella, gets its common name. It's one of the very best plants for dry shade situations. Uh, it's an attractive wildflower that spreads by underground stems to form these lovely little colonies and makes a great ground cover for shade. Uh, you can tell maybe it's a little bit that it's a, a cousin to coral bells. The tiny flowers and that fine texture of the stamens, uh, a lot of people think it resembles foam when you glance it in the shade garden. These are trusty perennials that make a great ground cover. Uh, many are trailing types and they can form actually a pretty dense mat. Uh, in the last 15 years, we've seen an enormous uh, increase in the number of cultivars that are available to gardeners. Uh, so there has never been a better time to collect foam flowers. Uh, four to 18 inches tall, um, moist, well-drained soils. Uh, occasionally slugs are a problem. I've never had that be an issue for me personally. And cold hardy in USDA zones, three to eight. Bishop's hat. Epimidium. I think this is my number one uh, choice for dry shade. Uh, easy to grow. It's a wildflower. They are tenacious plants and provide a welcome breath of spring with those airy flowers that you see here. And they have that uh, great backdrop of that attractive foliage that's uh, tinged red and burgundy. It's a member of the barberry family. Uh, it's uh, commonly called barren wart or bishop's hat and that is because of the shape of those blossoms. Uh, it's a tough and sturdy plant, native to the woodlands and rocky places of eastern Mediterranean and Asia. Uh, many species have now been introduced here on this side uh, of the world. It's a perfect ground cover, as I mentioned. Those wiry uh, stems give the plant sort of an overall buoyant uh, appearance. I don't know any other way to explain it. Uh, uh, quite a few of the species are evergreen, uh, so you'll see this uh, foliage persist and it does color up in the fall. The flowers can be white, yellow, pink, orange, or lavender. Uh, some people think they look like miniature columbines or daffodils. Uh, other people think they look like spiders or stars. Uh, some of them that have long sprays uh, can actually even look a little bit like orchids if you look closely. No serious pests and uh, cold hardy in uh, USDA zones four to nine. Bloodroot, Native American, uh, has the Latin name sanguinaria. You can hear the root word of uh, blood for bleeding in there. It's a fragile spring flower, uh, develops and rises uh, from the center of a very curled up leaf during the day and these close up at night. Like most members of the poppy family, these blossoms don't last uh, all that long. So uh, it has a short time, but it's certainly worth uh, the wait. The red juice from the underground stem was used by Indians and Native Americans as a dye for baskets, clothing, and for uh, paint, as well as for insect repellent. The generic name uh, reflects its name. Uh, 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 Latin for bleeding, as I mentioned, and you can see this in a leaf if you break it and you scrape it with your fingernail, you'll be able to see uh, uh, that blood red sap from the plant. Showier cultivars have found their way into a culture such as Flora Plana, and there is a great double out there called Multiplex, uh, that's the name of the cultivar, uh, that almost look like uh, miniature white uh, little double peonies. Best uh, mast in the, sh in the woodland uh, for uh, native plant or rock gardens uh, where plants can be left alone and be allowed to naturalize. Uh, six to 14 inches tall, uh, as I mentioned, blooms in early spring, not bothered by any serious pests and cold hardy to zones three to nine, that is bloodroot. Trout lily, erythronium. Uh, here's another beloved spring ephemeral. Trout lilies, maroon mottled leaves that you can see here, give rise to slender stalks that have these nodding yellow or white flowers. Uh, if you look at those leaves, uh, it's found, it, you usually see these in pretty large colonies. The common name, dog tooth violet, refers to the tooth-like shape of the white underground bulbs. Uh, but the name trout lily, which is a more suitable name since the flower isn't a violet at all, refers to the similarity between the leaf markings and those of brown or brook trout, uh, believe it or not. So 
Uh, that makes sense when you look at it now. Uh, you'll know those leaves um, reveal its common name. Uh, the white form, albedum, you see here, uh, has the bell-shaped flowers. It's often tinged with lavender on the outside. You can almost see that here. And that's found from southern Ontario to Georgia, west to Kentucky, Missouri, and Oklahoma, and north to Minnesota. After the plants have finished blooming, leave the foliage in place. Don't cut it back. The leaves will naturally uh, fade uh, during dormancy. Uh, anyway, so this is size 4 to 8 inches in height, cold hardy in USDA zones 3 to 8. Lungwort, and you can see sort of a theme here uh, with a similarity between this and the Virginia bluebells. Uh, lungwort or pulmonary is a large genus with members that will grow almost anywhere. Its season when it blooms is in early spring. Its flowers uh, are blue, pink, and white. They do change color, uh, just like the Virginia bluebells. Uh, a change in the pH of the petals is responsible for that change in color. Uh, pulmonary leaves are fuzzy, so they are deer resistant. Uh, they range from solid green uh, to nearly pure silver. You see some of the pretty uh, pretty varieties here splashed with polka dots uh, like Bertram Anderson in your upper left hand corner. Uh, it's a low growing plant although the flower stalks can reach about a foot, foot and a half tall. Uh, bees love these blossoms and uh, sometimes when you look at these it looks like the uh, leaves are almost splashed with uh, white paint, white or silver paint. Uh, they, they grow slowly to form uh, an attractive ground cover Great companions for bleeding hearts, hostas, and other spring flowering bulbs. Uh, palmo means lung in Latin because the spotted leaves of pulmonaria were thought to resemble, believe it or not, diseased lungs. Um, wart, W-O-R-T, is actually just Old English for plant. So when you hear in a common name, uh, uh, wart, spider wart, a lot of those plants were named by what they resemble, lung wart for uh, looking like a diseased lung, spider wart for resembling a spider, uh, and so on. Um, I mentioned 6 to 12 inches tall flowers in mid-spring, takes full shade, uh, so uh, anybody who's got a full shade condition, uh, turn to these plants. There's no serious pests, and uh, hardy in cold zones 3 to 8. Sweet woodruff is probably one of the best shade ground covers for all kinds of reasons. It's creeping, it's mat forming, uh, it's a perennial, great for shady areas, and bears these pretty clusters of dainty flowers that are very fragrant. Uh, in fact, all plants of the uh, all parts of the plants are, are fragrant, and if you allow the leaves and the flowers to dry, when you crush them, they give off like a vanilla scent. Uh, another note to Old English, sweet in common plant names often refers to fragrance. So if a plant is sweet violets or uh, sweet woodruff, uh, that implies that the plant is highly fragrant, and as is the case here. Um, it's used, to, the blossoms are used to make May wine in uh, Germany, Switzerland, and Austria, which is always a spring uh, tradition. Uh, although this appears very dainty, this is a tough little plant. Uh, it can take a little bit of foot traffic, so it's great to grow among pavers. Uh, if you have that situation, six to eight inches tall, part to full shade, uh, cold hardy in USDA zones five to eight. Uh, planted at the edge of a shady border. If you accidentally step on it, don't worry about it. It releases that lovely scent. Uh, but do keep an eye on it. It can be aggressive. Uh, it's easy to pull up, though, if it does run amok. Woodland phlox. This is the dainty version of our creeping flocks and our very robust garden flocks. And uh, you see this, this is native. Uh, and since it grows wild, uh, you probably uh, recognize it uh, readily from all over North America uh, woodlands. It produces these fragrant clusters of lavender, purple, blue, or white blossoms in early spring. It's a perfect companion for bulbs and other early spring bloomers. It grows 10 to 12 inches tall and wide, uh, full sun to part shade as I mentioned, no serious pests. Uh, it attracts important butterflies. This is an important nectar source for butterflies in spring and cold hardy in zones three to nine. Next we have Solomon Seal. 
uh, probably one of the hardest working plants for the shade garden. Uh, Native American plant, you may recognize it. I have it coming up in my yard, the little green plain native one. It's a really elegant plant, uh, although the waiting, the, those, I'm sorry, those dangling white flowers are charming. It's the arching stems and the foliage that make it such a fa favorite for the shade garden. These are stems that are really arch and are a pretty stiff stem plant that rise above other uh, companions in the shade garden. Beautiful when it emerges, first emerges in the spring. It slowly spreads out and creates a sort of a nodding blanket uh, of foliage that turns an otherworldly golden yellow in autumn. You can see that in the upper left-hand corner here. Uh, it looks almost ghost-like, but rather arresting when you uh, come upon it in autumn. Uh, when you're planting a garden in the shade, yeah, also remember these are fragrant, believe it or not, but it's really tough to you know, get up close to those blossoms. Uh, and uh, there's one that's especially highly fragrant. I did want to mention it. It's Polygonatum odoratum. Obviously, it's Latin name variegatum. So it's one of the variegated forms. Uh, this, as I mentioned, is a workhorse. Uh, such a workhorse that it was named the 2013 Perennial Plant of the Year from the Perennial Plant Association. A large purple seeds add interest in the fall. These can grow from two to seven feet tall, uh, if you look for the right varieties, one to two feet wide, uh, moist, hummusy, well-drained soil. Occasionally slugs can be a problem, although that's never been a problem for me, and uh, cold hardy in USDA zones three to nine. There's also a very miniature form, so if you enjoy miniature hostas and some of those smaller shade-loving plants, check out the uh, dwarf form of Solomon seal. Hakone grass. Uh, although most grasses prefer full sun, here is one that takes the shade. It's uh, one of the uh, one of the best. Uh, ornamental grasses to light up deep shade spots. It's commonly called Japanese forest grass. Uh, its native habitat is uh, uh, also gives a clue to its water requirement. It can grow in full sun and deep shade, but it needs consistent uh, moisture. Not wet feet, but regular watering. Uh, it's a tough plant, long-lived, easy to grow, uh, performs best in part shade, and as I mentioned, does like well-drained soil. Ultimately reaches about 24 inches tall. Uh, each clump is probably about that same width around wide. Uh, produces these lovely papery texture that almost looks like miniature bamboo in the garden. Very good for spreading ornamental. Works well as a ground cover. Uh, and adds that necessary pop of chartreuse, as you see, to dark settings. Uh, here you can see two forms, the areola, which is variegated with cream stripes, and the all gold, which gives you that really strong burst of chartreuse. Hardy uh, to USDA zones five to nine. And coral bells, uh, what is uh, more beloved than coral bells? I can't imagine, and their rise in popularity because of the incredible colors and textures these leaves have been bred to come in uh, is astounding, uh, truly astounding. Uh, but if you were going to make a checklist for the perfect shade plant, coral bells would tick off all the boxes. Multiple seasons of interest, yes. Handsome foliage, yes. Long-lasting flowers, yes. Minimal maintenance, yes. Numerous color options, yes. Uh, it's an amazing perennial. Uh, now that you can find the foliage in chartreuse, red, bronze, orange, purple, green, silver, and bicolors. Uh, so no, for, in terms of color, there's a heuchera or a coral bell for, for every garden. Blooms in late spring and early summer uh, with spikes of small red, white, or pink bell-shaped flowers, uh, as you can see pretty clearly here, uh, and gives it its common name, coral bells. Uh, 12 to 20 inches tall. Uh, great to edge uh, for edging pathways uh, and uh, walkways, or, or you can use it in a container. It combines really well or looks great in a container all by itself. Also deer resistant, uh, and uh, but just a note, heucheras have been uh, crossbred with the foam flowers or tiarella that we uh, talked about earlier and have created a new variety of plants that have the best attributes of each called heucherellas. So, if you're interested in that, dig a little deeper. You'll see those from Terra Nova uh, Nursery. Spotted dead nettle, or lamium. It is the perfect ground cover to brighten up partly or shady spots. 
in the garden, native to Europe, uh, temper, temperate Western Asia and North Africa. The common name of dead nettle river, uh, refers to the, its resemblance to the leaves of stinging nettles, but without the sting, which is the, obviously the dead part. Downy to softly hairy leaves, which are unpleasantly scented uh, when you bruise them. Uh, green with white or silver markings down the mid vein or other markings or variegation. As you can see in these cultivars shown here, we have pink uh, Chablis in the upper left. It uh, blooms prolifically from late spring to early summer and continues sporadically into fall, attracting bees, butterflies, and uh, bumblebees. Uh, typically, it's used as a ground cover in shady areas and can cover large areas rather quickly if that is an issue for you. Uh, adaptable to a number of light conditions, uh, so it's a great plant to use in transition areas in the garden and cold hardy in USDA zones 3 to 8 spotted dead nettle and bleeding heart. Here is one of the most beloved spring bloomers. It's a very easy to care for, shade loving, uh, pops up in early spring and grows uh, rather quickly uh, during the season. They're characteristic heart-shaped flowers that you see dangling here, bloom in shades of pink, red, or white and hang delicately from these arching stems from late spring to early summer. Uh, this is an old-fashioned cottage garden favorite for obvious reasons. Uh, they die back. This is another one of those ephemerals, uh, but they'll return again the, the following spring. Uh, there is one that has a, a fringed uh, uh, blossom. Actually, blossom is, it has tiny fringe on it. That's Dicentra ex eczema, uh, if you want to look, uh, look for that. Uh, they bloom for a longer time in general and uh, do not tend to go dormant. Uh, they're an outstanding choice for adding color and texture, especially gold heart, the chartreuse foliage form you see in the center here. Uh, you may want to mark where, they are, where they're planted so that you don't accidentally dig them up after they go dormant in late summer. And these are cold hardy in zones 2 to 9. Cardinal flower, another native American wildflower, uh, beloved and na named for its beautiful scarlet red flowers that you see here. Uh, with a butterfly fleeting on, on it. It's an important source of nectar for hummingbirds and uh, butterflies, especially swallowtails. The flowering sp spikes open from the bottom to the top, uh, and they bloom for several weeks. This is a, uh, a, a plant that likes it a little bit wetter, wetter conditions uh, than some of the other plants we've talked about here. They grow best in uh, uh, full sun to part shade. Uh, it's a native American plant. It's often used as an ornamental found throughout the eastern United States from southeastern Canada all the way down to Mexico, uh, like swamps, as I mentioned, and marshy areas. It was introduced to, the Europe, uh, to Europe in the mid-1620s where it earned its common name, uh, likely because the bright red flowers are the same color as the vestments worn by the Roman Catholic cardinals. Uh, it is hardy in zones 3 to 9. Hellebores. Hellebores sure have gained a lot of pe uh, popularity lately and for good reason. Uh, there's a lot happening in the world of hellebores. Recent breeding has introduced new colors, never before seen shapes, longer blooming times. Uh, these are nearly a perfect perennial, uh, perhaps because it's, they're so easy to grow. Uh, they bloom way before anything else. They have the common name of Lenten rose because many times they are blooming uh, around Easter time. Uh, most people can't resist the jewel tones uh, that you see here in the garden. And uh, a lot of these typically have nodding blossoms that aim downward, but uh, uh, breeding recently has brought them more upright uh, uh, so folks can uh, view their colors more easily. Um, the most commonly grown type is, uh, uh, is a cross called Helleborus ex hybridus. Uh, uh, they come in shades of white, rose, green, yellow, apricot, red, cream, purple, and near black. Uh, newer hybrids have spotted flowers and pointed petals. Uh, there are bicolors, they're dark centered, uh, there are even streaked ones that are out there now. New leaves emerge at bloom time, uh, which grow into a great lo uh, looking evergreen ground cover that will persist. You do want to clean up the previous year's uh, foliage at bloom time in the spring. Uh, they mix well with other shade-loving plants like hostas, ferns, and columbines. Uh, 
and of course spring blooming bulbs as well and cold hardy in USDA zones 4 to 9. Now let's talk about trees and shrubs for shade. Uh, and let's start with my favorite group, uh, my favorite genus, by far, the viburnums. Uh, there's no genus that offers as many attractive and useful shrubs uh, for shade. Uh, they hold their own in every season. Uh, there are lace cap and snowball types with spring flowers. Many of them are highly fragrant. Uh, many species, they bloom from late summer, and then they, all the way to late summer, then they get uh, uh, berries that color up in fall and persist through the winter. My favorite part, they are undemanding and completely unfussy. They take absolutely no care whatsoever. Uh, often grown as hedges, screens, or filler plants where their abundant berries attract birds and wildlife uh, later in the season. Many species have colorful fall foliage and hang on to their blue, red, black, or yellow berries, uh, making them attractive in all seasons. Viburnums bloom mid to late spring. Uh, in general, uh, the Korean spice that you see here ha have very fragrant flowers. Uh, some varieties have purple foliage uh, as well in the fall. Uh, plant height ranges from 5 to 15 feet. Uh, that would be tall and wide. That would be depending on the variety as well. And uh, the arrowwood uh, uh, is hardy, actually is one of the more hardy viburnums. So for our folks in northern climates, that's hardy all the way up to zone two. Uh, so make a note of that. Japanese maples, a familiar sight to uh, suburban gardeners. As the name suggests, Japanese maples originated in Eastern Asia and renowned for the exquisite foliage that you see here. The leaves have five to nine lobes and come in basically in green or red, but some have the variegation like ukigumo. Uh, that you see here that gives it that uh, uh, soft white. Uh, but also they turn beautiful shades of red, orange, yellow, and, and purple in the fall. There are many different textures to the leaves. Some have wide lobes while others are very finely dissected and almost lacy in appearance. Japanese maple flowers are small and red or purple. Uh, these become a dry winged fruit uh, that we recognize, a lot of people call them helicopters. They're called samaras, actually. And uh, these on Japanese maple are usually smaller, about a half inch long. Uh, vary, the trees vary in size from a small shrub uh, to a small tree. Uh, Japanese maple is a species with many, many variations. Cultivar vars are available with different characteristics. Some are even uh, have weeping branches and a weeping habit. Not all cultivars are fully hardy to zone five. Uh, and many may need protection in the winter. Uh, for folks uh, that live here, we're in Zone 5 Iowa, Central Iowa. Uh, a lot of times you plant them close to the foundation of the houses uh, and they benefit from the warmth and protection of the house. Uh, uh, Blood Good Japanese Maple is a tried and true specimen and it's one that you probably recognize uh, from the suburban landscape. Red Buckeye, or Aeschylus pavia, it's native from North Carolina south to Florida, west to central Texas, and as far north as Illinois. It's a handsome shrub, or a small tree in some cases, with very showy, they're called thyrses. Uh, people uh, refer to them as panicles. These are actually referred to, properly called thyrses, of deep red or yellow flowers in early spring. The tree reaches fit only 15 to 20 feet tall, uh, the flowers are in clusters that are 6 to 10 inches tall, and uh, the individual flowers, if you look very closely at them, are about an inch, inch and a half across. Uh, leaves usually drop by the end of the summer. Uh, it was the winner of a 1995 Pennsylvania Horticultural Society Gold Medal Award, uh, and the plant can be grown with multiple trunks or pruned to have a single trunk. Uh, and a great understory tree or a, a tree to consider underneath power lines if that is an issue for you where you, where you live. Uh, it's an important tree for uh, wildlife, uh, ideal uh, beneath existing shade trees, uh, a plant that if you live in a climate that can take it, I suggest you check it out. Um, that is the red buckeye. Rhododendron, uh, familiar to all of us, uh, but if you are looking for an evergreen shrub, that loves shade and bears very showy flowers like you see here. Uh, this is low maintenance and rhododendrons uh, last for decades. They're a very long-lived plant. 
Um, the rhododendrons and their very close relatives, you recognize the similarity by looking here at azaleas. They've been treasured for generations uh, for these spectacular, but sometimes short-lived uh, display of flowers. Uh, the name rhododendron comes from the Greek word so that actually means rose tree. Uh, they're usually evergreen, uh, so they provide interest uh, in all seasons. Uh, there's about somewhere between 900 and 1,000 different species. So it is a huge group of plants uh, uh, that deserves a lot of attention uh, if you're looking for the right one for, for, uh, for your garden. Um, let me see what I was going to say. They tower, some of them can tower up to 80 feet or more. Uh, they can be massed, they make great hedges, great screens. Uh, varieties can be found with leaves of many shapes, colors, and sizes uh, that can provide sort of a different textural uh, background. Some of them have a, a, almost a felted bottom uh, to them, a coppery sheen to them as well. Uh, uh, lavender, rose, or pink flowers, uh, obviously the colors uh, vary with the cultivar. Bloom in clusters, there's probably four to nine uh, flowers per, cl per cluster. Typically bloom in April. Uh, and hardy in USDA zones four to eight rhododendrons. Red bud, another Native American uh, classic part of our woodland landscapes. Uh, most people never forget the first time they see a red bud in full bloom. That's because there's tiny clusters of itty bitty magenta buds uh, that that swell. Let me get this right. They swell into showy, rosy pink flowers in early spring before the leaves appear. And the blossoms appear on the trunks and the branches uh, as well. And they persist for about two to three weeks. Uh, as you can see here, how tightly those clusters are and what a show it puts on. Uh, buds appear to emerge right from the bark. Uh, it does have these beautiful heart-shaped leaves. You see the chartreuse form here in rising sun. Uh, there is also a maroon form as well. Uh, two to six inches uh, on the size of, the, of those leaves. Uh, uh, and the flowers also give rise to bean-like pods that remain on the tree all the way through winter. Uh, they are adaptable to a wide range of, of conditions and take a lot of different soil types. Great understory tree, uh, 20 to 30 feet tall, cold hardy in zones four to nine. Next we have mock orange or Philadelphus. As the mock in the name suggests, mock orange is not a true orange, but the citrusy smell of the blossoms is enough to invite comparison to any citrus. Uh, I think mostly people grow this uh, not for these showy white blossoms, but actually for fragrance. It's a late sp uh, spring bloomer and it's a deciduous shrub. Uh, it looks great when placed in a border, used in groups as a screening. Uh, also makes excellent cut flowers uh, to bring indoors and enjoy that fragrance. Uh, it, as I mentioned, the fragrance is the main selling point for maca orange, but not all cultivars are equally fragrant. Uh, so a good time to buy maca orange is when they're in bloom, so you can check out to make sure that the one you're buying does have good fragrance. But note that most of these give off their fragrance uh, late in the day or in the evening. Uh, four to eight feet tall, a little rangy, uh, and cold hardy in zones four to eight. Uh, when you see mock orange, uh, be sure to get a nose full of that scent. Mountain laurel, one of my favorite plants. I wish I could grow it here. We can't grow it here in Iowa. Calmia latifolia. This is a shade-loving shrub. Uh, North American native with gorgeous flowers that you can see here that bloom in late spring and early summer. It's a close, close relative to the rhododendrons and azaleas and uh, another great choice for the shade garden. This is an evergreen shrub. Uh, so after the blooms have faded, its leathery deep green foliage uh, provides interest even in the coldest winter uh, when rhododendron leaves are all sh shriveled up, uh, these, the foliage on mountain laurel uh, makes it through any conditions and any elements and looks like a million bucks. Uh, in addition to being shade tolerant, it produces these exquisite clusters of delicate fused petal blossoms that resemble tiny origami rice bowls, or I like to think of them as sort of sugary confections. Uh, when the bur buds burst open in May or June, the branches are almost covered, sometimes as you can see here, uh, with the blossoms. Uh, 
Um, they can range from white to pink or deep rose and are distinctly tattooed, if you look at that center image, with symmetrical maroon or purple dots or streaks. Uh, so really curious flowers if you're not familiar with them. Six to 15 feet tall. Uh, there are dwarf varieties and more co compact forms available and cold hardy to USDA zones five to nine. Winter hazel, not to be confused with witch hazel. This is winter hazel or Coralopsis. It's a Asian native uh, valued for these sweet scented bell shaped soft yellow flowers. Uh, that hang in clusters on those bare branches, as you can see uh, in both of these images. The foliage follows after the blossoms, uh, and it's a foliage that has a toothed leaf that looks very much like a hazelnut uh, leaf, uh, but they turn uh, to great fall color. They turn beautiful shades of yellow uh, in fall, so you've got a couple of seasons of interest, interest there. Uh, rather open structure to the plant uh, with a really delicate branching habit. Uh, they like the same soil conditions as rhododendron, so that would make a great companion. 8 to 15 feet tall, uh, cold hardy in USDA zones 6 to 9. Uh, grow it in a sheltered spot uh, in the shrub border or in the woodland. And another benefit is it is not, uh, it, deer don't tend to eat it, so that's another choice for folks that are looking for deer resistant plants for the home landscape. And hydrangeas, the beloved, the ubiquitous hydrangea that is everywhere. Uh, it's probably one of the most recognizable flowers, especially these days in the landscape. Uh, and they've never been more popular than they are right now. Uh, spanning heights of from one to sometimes even 10 feet tall. Uh, bloom times from late spring, uh, they uh, all the way through fall in shades of pink, purple, blue, red, white. Uh, they can be the highlight of the garden all season long uh, if you make the right choice. You can choose from full rounded mop head flowers or more delicate lace uh, cap types depending on the type. Uh, out of the, the 30 species of hydrangea, there's about a half dozen that are cultivars, uh, uh, a half dozen species and cultivars that have made their way into the gardens. Uh, but it's the colors uh, more than the shape that stands out and distincts, uh, makes each of these hydrangeas distinct from each other, as you can see here. Um, as if those, uh, uh, well, I wanted to mention, flowers change from pink to blue or vice versa. The key to changing that color, and a lot of people ask this, lies in the pH or the degree of acidity in your soil. Uh, to create colors of your choosing, that means uh, controlling the acidity of that soil to make them pinker or bluer, test your soil and amend it at the end of the growing season for the following year. Oh, I did want to mention uh, oak leaf hydrangeas uh, are one of uh, uh, my most favorite uh, in the home landscape. The leaves do resemble uh, oak leaves. It is, uh, becomes a very dramatic uh, blooming show throughout the season. I've trained mine into a tree-like shape, uh, and they are hardy in zones, uh, the oak leaf hydrangeas, in zones five to nine. Father Gilla, native shrub with super spicy honey scented cream flowers. Wonderful deep green uh, leaves that turn this beautiful uh, burgundy red in fall. Uh, and they actually get uh, shades of red, yellow, and orange all on the same leaf. Uh, and they last all the way till frost. Native to southeastern United States makes uh, a great use in a hedge or in a shrub border. Small mounted shrub, only about three feet tall with attractive crooked multiple stems. Uh, has a sort of contorted look to it in the landscape. Uh, there are two major Father Gilla species. Both are deciduous shrubs native to swamps and woodlands of southeastern United States. They're from about one and a half feet. Uh, 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 some of these you can get them to three, uh, up to 10 feet tall if you're looking uh, uh, for newer cultivars and cold hardy in USDA zones four to eight. And vines, our last category of shade-loving plants, and we're going to begin with honeysuckle, uh, or uh, often referred to as trumpet honeysuckle. This high-climbing twining vine grows 3 to 20 feet tall with glossy semi-evergreen leaves and 2 to 4 flowered clusters of red tubular 
blooms followed by bright red berries. The vine has showy trumpet-shaped flowers that are red on the outside and yellow on the inside. Uh, it also has papery exfoliating bark that can be quite handsome uh, when you pull back the blossoms to get a look at it or if you uh, prune it in that shape so you can ha uh, see that at the foot of the plant. Uh, appreciate that uh, beautiful papery bark. Um, it's a slender climbing vine and frequently visited by hummingbirds. It's not too aggressive. It's a good uh, climber or ground cover. It can get heavy on an arbor and may, be, uh, need, need, may need to be thinned out over the years, uh, but it's not a difficult vine to control. Uh, you can see the yellow form, John Clayton here. Uh, it blooms in June all the way through to November. Hey, our next vine for shade is climbing hydrangea. I think it's the holy grail for a lot of gardeners. In fact, there's even a little rhyme that people use when they're talking about it, which is the first year you plant it, it sleeps, the second year it creeps, and the third year it leaps. Uh, it's slow to get going, uh, but this is the climbing version of our beloved hydrangea, and it adds uh, year-round interest to shady spots in the garden. Plant it near a wooden post or a stone wall. As you see here, it's attractive. Uh, dark green foliage uh, creates an almost three-dimensional aspect once it gets going in the garden. And in summer, it produces these flat-topped, creamy white flowers that put on a spectacular show, one that is really hard to forget once you see it. It's easy to grow, it's carefree, it's long-lived. If you've got a shade garden, get this going uh, as soon as you can. This is a vigorous climbing vine that clings to surfaces by aerial rootlets. It has a slow-growing shrubby habit uh, until it does get established. Um, this is deciduous uh, and uh, these uh, are um, grow 30 to 80 feet tall, uh, tolerate some pruning uh, if you want to get it down to shorter heights, uh, and some people even with constant pruning keep it growing sort of almost like a shrub. Uh, variegated kiwi vine. A lot of folks may not know this, but this is a hardy kiwi, and the one we see here, Actinidia colomicta, uh, has this outrageously uh, variegated foliage. So. Uh, it's a large climber and produces a striking mass of heart-shaped leaves and actually produces edible fruit that you see here. Uh, uh, some leaves are solid green and others are heavily variegated with white and pink. It has pleasantly scented flowers in early summer, but they're hidden by the foliage. Uh, that fruit is edible and delicious, but that comes only on the female plants and that's in the early fall. The fruits don't have the fuzz on them and the skin is actually soft and tender. Uh, it's a fast climbing vine, so it's great for hiding eyesores in a single season. Uh, it's best to train it on a sturdy support uh, like a trellis, an arbor, or a pergola. It can be trained to form a broad canopy or to branch out horizontally in sort of an espaliered form as well. Grows about up to 20 feet tall and cold hardy in USDA zones 4 to 8. And Virginia creeper, this should be familiar to a lot of us, uh, Parthenocissus. Uh, it's famous for its gorgeous fall color. It's a close relative to Boston ivy. Uh, you can use it as a ground cover or as a climbing vine for stone walls and trellises. Uh, it supports itself by uh, grasping tendrils. Its leaves have five leaflets and morph from summer green into their uh, fall color. Uh, reddish orange to burgundy. The flowers aren't much to look at, but the Virginia creeper berries uh, are attractive and they turn a dark blue and are a favorite of birds for fattening up late in the season. Grows in full shade and its adaptability uh, makes it suited for any sites, uh, but uh, be sure not to grow it on, wooden, uh, on wood siding or gutters. The vine climbs and adheres uh, with those aerial roots and the weight of the plant can pull off boards uh, or misaligned gutters. Grows up to 50 feet tall, cold hardy, and USDA zones three to nine. And one of my most favorite climbers, and it can be rampant, but this is sweet autumn clematis. Again, remember I mentioned the reference to the word sweet, so it infers that this plant does have fragrance. This is a gorgeous sight when it's covered in pure white fragrant flowers in late summer. Sweet autumn clematis becomes a silvery mass of fluffy seed heads later in the fall. It's a hardy climber, a rampant grower. It can easily reach 30 feet. Um, I have seen it cover a, the wall of a three-story building. Uh, in New York City. It blooms on the current year's growth and unlike many clematis, it will thrive and bloom in the shade. 
Uh, if left unchecked, sweet arm clematis is considered somewhat invasive, uh, but when properly maintained, it can be very well behaved. Most varieties, as I said, uh, tolerate shade. Uh, like other clematis, it prefers well-drained soil and cool feet, so keep its soil at the base mulched or shaded by annuals or other plants. Uh, once the show is over, uh, it's time to get a grip on this plant. Uh, a lot of people keep it in the home landscape. After it's done blooming, we'll prune it back hard to about 12 inches. or just like a foot in the landscape every year and let it regrow uh, each year. So keep that in mind. So there we have a whole bunch of shade plants uh, that I love, that, that I think deserve a place or some consideration in the home garden. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I do want to remind you that we do have a uh, resource of a PDF of this presentation. Uh, you can uh, download it uh, from the registration, uh, the seminar registration page. Uh, so for those of us here at Garden Gate, uh, thank you very much and I hope you join us for our next seminar. Mm -hmm.